Okay, um, uh, historical geology students, um, I hope you had a great spring break, but we have to get back to work here. And we're going to, last time we talked a little bit about Mr. Charles Darwin, and he was a man who changed science. He definitely changed biology because his theory, theory of evolution through natural selection is well accepted um, as being the foundation of modern day biology. It's how we develop new antibiotics. It's through, uh, it's through our knowledge of evolution. It's how we breed dogs. It's how we study diseases. And how it's how did he come up with his theory of evolution? Well, in order to understand that, uh, I, I thought I'd do this first short video and talk a little bit about his life. He grew up in England and in the early to late to the later part of the 19th century and here he, here's a picture of a drawing of young Charles Darwin after he made his vo his famous voyage on HMS Beagle HMSN for his majesty's servant and let's talk a little bit about his life in the short video and then we'll get more into it uh, in the next video in order to do that let's talk about some of the people who influenced Charles Darwin because it was those influences which led to him developing the theory of evolution through natural selection. This is a, a picture of Robert Darwin, Charles Darwin's father. Robert Darwin had a very strong effect on Charles Darwin, Darwin growing up. He was a medical doctor, well respected in English society, and a, a, a very large man, 336 pounds, I think, and about six foot two. He would sit around the fireplace and give lectures and, and tell stories to his eight children, including young Charles, about how to be a proper English gentleman or a lady proper behavior, proper manners, and um, he wanted them all to become respected in English society. He wanted that of, for young Charles as well. So Robert Darwin was probably the person who had the greatest effect on Charles. Charles wasn't very close to his mother. And Robert Darwin sent Charles to all of the best schools at the time that were available so he could learn um, history, math, religion, science. And it has to be said that as a teenager, Charles Darwin did not show much promise. He was bored out of his skull by especially learning all the, uh, the um, Latin and Greek and all these foreign languages. It, it wasn't his cup of tea, so to speak. He, his true love was nature. And young Charles would keep uh, his boots right next to his bed. So as soon as he got out of bed, he had to put his feet right in those boots. He didn't want to waste a minute. And he would take these long hikes along the English countryside and he want he was he was fascinated by nature one of the things he noticed as a young man was the diversity within species sp sexual species now there's two forms of life on planet earth there's sexual organisms and I'm assuming that anyone who's watching this video is homo sapiens and all sexual species. So you are a sexual species because you're male or you're female. DNA, your DNA wise and in your cell structure, you're male or female. 
However, there are other organisms on our planet that are asexual. They reproduce by cloning themselves, such as bacteria. Well, Darwin noticed that amongst sexual organisms, those with male and female who do sexual reproduction, there is diversity so that if you look at the 8 billion people on the planet today, not, there is not one person on the planet who's exactly the same. Everybody's a little bit different or a lot different in their appearance, their height, their susceptibility to getting diabetes, um, their chances of them getting cancer, um, how fast they're going to run, um, whether or not they're going to be successful in uh, nuclear physics. Uh, all of these things are hardwired. I mean, of course, part of it is learning uh, in your environment, but a lot of it is in your genes. It's in your genetic makeup. Darwin noticed that amongst beetles, he especially loved to collect beetles. Not John, Paul, George, and Ringo, but little insects. And he and and there are records of him picking up a beetle in one hand and then picking up a beetle in another hand and he wanted to collect a third beetle. He got so excited he threw it into his mouth and he, um, the beetle emitted this noxious chemical and he had to spit it out. This is according to his first girlfriend by the name of Fanny Owen. He, she witnessed this. And so Charles, it, it appeared like he wasn't going to be successful because he would drink gin and whiskey into the late hours of the night and play poker and other card games and just wander around the English countryside and not pay attention to his studies. So Robert Darwin was very concerned about this. And he thought that Charles was leading a life that would lead to um, ill repute. And he asked young Charles to study um, at college and would go to study. And Charles studied to be a minister in the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church, we have um, an Anglican Church in Knoxville. It's called the, who, who's the um, head of the Anglican Church? Does anybody know? I'll give you a hint. Hello, my royal subjects. I'm worried about my son, Charles. Who's that? That's my attempt at a silly English woman's accent. I mean, a royal English woman's accent, I should say. I don't mean to be rude, but who is that? Queen Elizabeth is the head of the Anglican Church. Anyway, Charles wanted to be a minister in the Anglican Church. It's important to note that Charles always believed in a creator. And a lot of people misinterpret what he said when he came up with a theory of evolution. He believed in um, Christianity to the day he died. He simply believed that God had created evolution so that his creations could survive. And that's the only way they're going to survive is if they change. Now, his faith in it was... Um, affected by many different things and it was challenged and we'll talk about that but young Charles uh, he first studied to be a minister but that was not his true love his true love was biology studying nature and he spent a lot of time studying uh, variations in dogs and horses and he wondered how did all of this variability come into being? You have, uh, for example, among dogs, you have uh, Great Danes, and you have Beagles, and you have Spaniels, and you have uh, Pomeranians. They came by humans selecting traits that they admired in dogs, right? Whether a German Shepherd to be a guard dog, or a Pomeranian to be a companion dog, or a sheep dog to herd sheep. Um, if humans could select traits that they wanted, why couldn't nature select traits 
too. The, the, that was in his mind. And eventually he would go to Cambridge University and study, study under uh, Professor John Henslow. And there's a picture of Professor John Henslow. Professor Henslow was a biology uh, taught um, uh, biology and some geology, and he um, really helped Charles learn about things like fossils, that, which we're going to be talking about in this class. And Charles learned that fossils are evidence of past life. And many English scientists had known that the fossils that are found in older rocks, which are always on the bottom, principal superposition, are different than the ones on top. And Charles got in his head and he thought, well, if species stayed the same, how come the fossils don't show it? All of these things were coming into his head. He um, had a young girlfriend, uh, and her name was Fanny Owen, and that was another effect on his life. They used to, he he thought uh, very, uh, uh, he was very fond of Fanny Owen, and the two of them would have long talks together, sitting in the strawberry patch, uh, discussing um, nature and what Darwin's ideas, and they did other things there that young people do. And anyway, um, so, Darwin would not even be a footnote into history unless this man here, Captain Robert Fitzroy, appeared uh, in the 1830s uh, with his ship, HMS Beagle, in London. And Captain Fitzroy um, commanded a ship called HMS Beagle. Captain Fitzroy wanted to get a young scientist aboard to um, make scientific ob observations about the life that was encountered and the fossils that are collected, uh, a young naturalist. Um, and the reason why he wanted that was because that would bring uh, um, accolades from the scientific community and fame to him if he had a young scientist aboard. And Darwin was a very good scientist having learn from uh, at Cambridge, that one of the best universities, probably the best university in Great Britain under Henslow. And um, so he advertised for a young naturalist to come aboard his ship. And Charles heard about it. He was so excited. And, but you remember, you got to remember, this is not the year 2000. 21. This is the year 1932. I mean, 1832, and you can't just. Uh, even though he was a grown man, he couldn't just do what he wanted. Back in those days, in Victorian England, uh, I should say 1831, you had to have approval from your father to do anything, and so Charles uh, went to his father Robert Darwin and asked for permission to go on a voyage on HMS Beagle, which would be for several years. Robert Darwin said no. And the reason why he said no was um, many young Englishmen and uh, they went on these ships and they never came back home. And H HMS Beagle was a ship, it was a frigate that had a bad reputation for sinking. And some people, uh, sailors caught it call them floating coffins. So he just didn't want his son to die, basically. He was worried, and so he said no. But Charles was adamant, and he said to his father that this is what I want to do with my life. I want to explore uh, and, and travel around the world in this ship and, and study nature, the diversity in nature and in species and look for fossils and see what that tells me about how, um, about why there's so much diversity within organisms of the same species. And he just kept pushing and his father finally said, okay, if you can show me one man who I respect 
who approves of your mission, then um, I will allow you to go. So Robert went, um, uh, Charles Darwin went to his uncle. Uh, his uncle, uh, Robert Wedgwood, heir to the Wedgwood Pottery Empire. I'm sure you've heard of Wedgwood Pottery. It's famous from Britain. Uh, he asked his uncle to talk to his father, and he talked his uncle into talking to his father, and uh, to uh, to um, and he basically told the uncle told the father, if you don't let him go, um, he'll be frustrated for the rest of the, his life, and he'll bear resentment towards you. And you have to let him grow up, be a man, and see the world. You can't hold him close to home. And so finally, Robert Darwin relented and allowed Charles to go. Charles traveled around the world, as you can see here from your book. He started in England. First, he went south to South America. And when he went to South America... He was a very tough young man. He could, uh, he rode horses with the gauchos of Argentina, uh, these tough cowboys, and he could keep up and he did very well. And he would, he would wonder. He he wondered something. He saw these armadillos, and he would uh, eat them. And he would look at at the rocks, and he found that there were these ancient creatures called glyptodon. They were just like armadillos of today, but much larger with a mace on the back of their tail. And he wondered, why? What happened so that with time did these glyptodons become these smaller armadillos? And what would cause this change? And he looked at other fossils and he noticed that they were different than the modern day equivalents and he wondered why did they change and it was at this point Charles was dealt his first major blow when his girlfriend wrote him a letter stating that uh, she tried to wait for him and she did promise to wait for him but that she fell in love with another man and this broke, broke young Charles's heart. And on top of that, he was seasick. So he was seasick, throwing up. Uh, Charles was a, a six foot tall uh, guy. He was a big guy. And the ship was very small. And the, and, the, and the movement of the ship was making him throw up. Plus, his girlfriend had just dumped him. So he went into this deep depression. But uh, as they traveled south towards Tierra de Fugo, which is the southern tip of South America, he. He um, went into the uh, into the woods and the forest, and he would walk. and He basically said that um, even though I have lost the the woman of my life, that I no, he probably said it like this: even though I haven't lost, I lost the woman of my life, the one who meant so much to me. I have found a new love. And that love is nature. And nature could fulfill a man. And it's just as powerful, perhaps even more powerful in every sense, in fulfilling what I need for myself at this point in my life. He probably he said something like that. It weren't those exact words. But then finally, they went to the Galapagos Islands. And when he got to the Galapagos Islands... Charles noticed something that would change history. Galapagos Islands finches. And he would look at the finches and he would notice that on certain islands and these are Darwin's actual pictures here Oh, holy mother of God, where is it there? Okay, these are Darwin's actual pictures. You notice that on some islands, the finches had these heavy, big beaks, perfect for crushing nuts. And on other islands, they would have uh, other beaks that they're almost 
seem designed to eat fruit and other ones that have thin delicate beaks perfect for getting into crevices and picking out insects and they wondered why is it that on each different island the birds had beaks that matched the food that they wanted to eat and he also had collected finches on the South American mainland because the Galapagos Islands are off the South American mainland and notice that those finches clearly had all of the same basic features as these on the Galapagos Islands. So on the mainland you have finches and then when you go to the Galapagos Island you have finches that clearly seem to be related to those on the mainland but have developed different beaks and different shapes to their heads and he wondered why. Later on when he went back to England he would figure it out. The reason why is because of nature selecting who gets to survive. For example if you were on a island where there were nuts on the island you needed a big heavy beak in order to crush those nuts and you had a thin delicate beak like this you would starve to death right and therefore you would not pass on your genetic information if you were on another island where the diet was insects and you needed a thin delicate long beak to eat uh, and you had a large heavy beak like this you would not survive so eventually Darwin would figure it out that those who have the traits that are necessary for survival are those who get to pass on those traits to the next generation and that would that's a big part of his theory of evolution through natural selection but it all began there and then Darwin traveled around the world and he noticed that again ancient species clearly are related to modern species but they have changed and he would figure out that the change is caused because as environments changed what is needed for survival changes and therefore certain traits will be advantages and get passed on that would be his theory of evolution through natural selection but it was still brewing in his head while he was on his voyage when Darwin came back to England after his long voyage several years he um, was 27 years old he did not he asked himself the question do I want to get married or not and I, I he wrote uh, he actually wrote down the advantages and disadvantages of getting married if you read his books and the advantages of getting married he wrote down as being uh, having a nice comfortable home and a, a, a pleasant a woman to rest his shoulder on after a long day of day of work and children and I think uh, for his disadvantages he wrote uh, nagging quarreling and forced to visit in-laws but anyway he eventually decided that he did want to get married and I know it sounds strange to us uh, but in England back then if you were of nobility you could marry your cousin and Charles ended up marrying his cousin Emma Darwin there she is as many English people did in upper-class society like the royal family I mean the, Queen Elizabeth is related to Prince Philip and that's why they have so many problems um, with hemophilia and other things anyway he married Emma Darwin and he in his mind he was coming up with his theory of evolution through natural selection and he started to write it all down but there was a conflict in his life and that conflict was his wife who was a born-again Christian and she believed in the Bible literally that God created 
all of the species and they had not changed. Darwin tried to convince her that maybe God, you're not giving God enough credit, that God could have create, made his creations um, through evolution. And this was a big debate between the two, but they loved each other and they ended up having, I think, um, seven kids. Darwin was a very good father. Um, very good father. Uh, in the Victorian age, uh, where fathers were authoritarian and distant, he was loving and openly loving and caring of his children and played with them. Um, but his situation was this. If he came up with his, if he published his theory of evolution through natural selection, he knew that potentially the Church of England would attack him and he would lose his position in British society. He had already become moved up with the highest and the noblest in the scientific community due to his voyage on HMS Beagle. He joined the Athenaeum, which was an elite gentleman's club where the greatest scientists of the day share their ideas. People like James Hutton, Sir Charles Lyell, Sir Isaac Newton, they're, they're, they're all in that society, the Athenaeum and the Royal Geological Society, which you can still visit in London today. He was a, a, a well-respected person in the scientific community. Did he really want to risk that by publishing his theory of evolution through natural selection? Plus, the conflict with his wife made him not want to do that. Now, Charles Darwin had a daughter um, that was his favorite. And her, this, this was his favorite daughter, Annie Darwin. Um, he, Annie Darwin was the only one allowed to work, uh, to come into the, his study, because they had bought a house together, him, uh, Charles and Emma, in Shrewsport, England. Shrewsport, England. And um, Annie was the only child that he allowed to play in the study while he was working. And she would um, walk with Charles Darwin uh, when he was walking, Across, around his estate and she would dance around in these circles and he thought she was such a beautiful little girl. Unfortunately, um, his daughter Annie became sick and we don't know what the disease was but she started to get sicker and sicker. Charles was frantic. He started to call doctors in from throughout England and Scotland and Wales to visit his daughter and but no matter what happened she kept getting sicker and she died on Easter day and I think that really broke his heart his hair turned white and he said he could no longer believe in a loving and caring God and that's what a lot of people point to when they said Charles Darwin was an atheist but really that's not fair he had Imagine that you had just lost your your daughter who you loved so much. You might have a loss of faith for a day or two or even a week like Darwin did. And so he had that, and there was a real challenge to his faith. But you can't judge him based on a statement he made on the day his daughter died, in my opinion. So um, Charles kept his idea of theory of evolution through natural selection um, in his head because he did not want to risk his family's reputation and break his wife's heart. Uh, and things wouldn't change until later on when this man, Alfred, he met this man, Alfred Wallace. And we'll talk about that in the next video.